Hey everyone, this video will go over the highlights of culture and society from the 1950s. Uh, so one of the things the 50s is probably best known for is uh, being a period of peace and prosperity. This is, uh, you know, coming out of World War II, uh, the economy was booming um, for, for a multitude of reasons. And as is always the case, it doesn't affect every sector of the population equally, but in general, uh, the country was on a pretty good footing throughout the decade of the 1950s. This was spurred on by the GI Bill, uh, officially known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act in 1944. Uh, this provided programs to assist returning World War II veterans uh, in a way that veterans of previous American wars had not uh, been helped. At the end of World War I, soldiers for the most part took their discharge and that was it. They got no money, no pension from the military, that kind of thing, um, at least not for an extended period of time or not in a large amount, which actually led to some uh, widespread poverty among World War I veterans during the uh, Depression. So Congress passed the GI Bill uh, to try to avoid uh, a repeat uh, of that. So the GI Bill provides, uh, again, several programs to help uh, returning veterans, most notably uh, the easy home loans that could be gotten with relatively cheap money, and also money to pay for college. Uh, and a lot of colleges end up springing up in the 1940s and early 50s just to educate World War II veterans. Uh, if you're in North Carolina like me, um, you may know this, but uh, UNC Charlotte was founded in 1946 as the Charlotte Center of UNC. Uh, it was just a night school, basically a community college, uh, to serve returning World War II vets. And there are uh, quite a few colleges all across the country um, like that. That, that were founded in the 40s with that goal in mind. Uh, but with uh, more people owning homes and more people having college educations and being able to get better jobs, uh, it leads to a much larger middle class uh, throughout the country. And uh, this leads to an explosion in suburbia in the late 40s and into the 1950s, uh, where bedroom communities began popping up around major cities across the country uh, that were primarily residential. And um, the prime example of this, and, and by far not the only one, uh, is Levittown, which was a planned community in uh, the suburbs of New York City, Long Island, uh, that was founded in 1947. Uh, all the homes virtually looked the same, uh, maybe painted different colors and stuff, but the floor plans were all very similar. Um, you can see from uh, the picture there that you know they were pretty close together, had a little bit of a yard, um, but you know again cookie cutter everything's basically the same but uh living in the suburbs during this time kind of becomes an ideal uh the idea that you could you know use the new interstate system to commute to your job and then come home in the evening and uh the kids had come home from their nice suburban schools and and the wife who didn't have to work made dinner and all of that and and uh you begin to see stuff pop up in cities like shopping malls or in suburbs rather uh shopping malls and big box stores uh you know getting away from having to go like into a center city district to shop um you know you, you begin to see you know malls and stuff like that like you would see he if you're in the triangle like i am like you know what you see in places like Cary and apex and stuff like that um all of this leads also to an explosion in the birth rate uh, in the late 40s and into the 1950s that becomes known as the baby boom uh with the soldiers coming home from the war getting educated uh, getting a house, getting married, and then those families start having kids. Um, it peaked in 1957 when there was one baby born every seven seconds uh, in the United States, uh, and uh, as a result, a, you know, a huge uh, population growth uh, during that time as as families grow and get larger. Now, again, not all people and not all families were able to sort of take part in this prosperity. Uh, racial discrimination was rampant in these suburban communities. A lot of them had covenants that said that they were only for white uh, buyers and white residents. Um, and the GI Bill wasn't discriminatory on its face, but in practice ends up being so um, because maybe the GI Bill didn't discriminate in which um, soldiers got uh, access to these programs, but the colleges did. So and the neighborhoods did right. So you know, if you were a black veteran, uh, you maybe could access GI Bill funding for college, but you wouldn't be able to find a college that would accept you. Um, and and there weren't as many colleges for African Americans at the time. So you know, there there were still some difficulties there um, that that blacks faced, even the ones who were World War II veterans. 
So as you can see with the uh, with suburbia and all the houses looking the same and stuff like that, one of the big ideals of the 1950s becomes conformity, um, where there again is this ideal where you know uh, the the man works a white collar job, things like advertising, public relations, um, you know, working in an office building in the big city and then commuting back to the suburbs in the evening. Um, it was very very uncommon to find married women with jobs. It wasn't unheard of completely, but you didn't see it very much. Um, single women might work secretarial jobs and stuff like that, but you know you didn't have a lot of female managers or anything like that. Um, and the uh, women's unhappiness or or discontent with uh, with this situation does lead to the women's rights movement in the sixties and seventies, where women begin to look for more uh, opportunities outside of the home. Um, but when you think of the 1950s, uh, a lot of this is kind of egged on by television. But, you know, the, the idea was that everyone kind of had the same life, which I've already mentioned. You know, the husband works, the wife stays home, the kids go to school and the kids never get in trouble. They're, uh, you know, perfectly well behaved and and sex was not even a thing. Right. Like if you've ever watched I Love Lucy or some of those other shows from the 50s, when they're in the parents bedroom, the parents sleep in separate beds with like a nightstand in between them, which is Obviously, uh, you know, not what actually happened in real life. Of course, you know, there were still you know, parents slept in a queen or king size bed together just like they would now. But um, th they couldn't show that on television. Uh, it was it was seen as being vulgar. Uh, and, and so um, I put on there. It's basically the movie Pleasantville. If you've ever seen that, it's a movie from the late 90s where it's a sci fi movie where these kids uh, from the 90s get sucked into a 1950s TV show called Pleasantville. And they find that like. Uh, you know, the basketball team at the high school never loses. Uh, they never even miss a shot. Uh, the parents don't know what sex is <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, it's a good movie. It's worth checking out. Heavy McGuire, Reese Witherspoon. Anyway, um, a lot of this was kind of egged on by television and advertisements on television, which would advertise products you could buy. Um, you know, movies kind of showed this idyllic life, right? Uh, magazines ran stories about American life in the suburbs and stuff like that, which led to this idea of what was called keeping up with the Joneses, um, which was just that, you know, like you wanted to have all the stuff your neighbors had because you wanted to conform. Um, you, you, um, you know, they got a new TV, you wanted to get a new TV. They had a washing machine, you wanted a washing machine, right? Um, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, not everyone was happy with all of this, which is the subject of the movie Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, which was a book, which if you're wondering what those pictures were up there, uh, Man in the Gray Flannel Suit was about this man who lived this, you know, white collar um, uh, job slash suburban family life and he was relentlessly unhappy and the whole family was unhappy right so um, it was nice on the surface but maybe not so much underneath um, another thing that really impacted culture in the 50s was uh, the explosion in uh, prevalence of cars um, families before this typically would only have one car if they had one at all but as cars became more affordable to more middle class families you begin to see uh, families with two cars or more and that meant that there was one for the kids to use and they could go out and you know go to the movies or go to the mall or um, go you know get into whatever monkey shines whatever right um, and, and so a lot of industries popped up that were sort of spurred on by this explosion in, in, in the number of cars that were out there. Um, fast food restaurants, uh, most of which were drive-ins early on. You see a picture there of uh, an early McDonald's from the 1950s. Burger King was founded in 1954. Uh, Wendy's was founded sometime in the early 60s. So um, those, all, those all pop up as people are able to you know, drive to those spots and, and want to pick their food up. Uh, drive-in movie theaters. Um, still exist, not as common now, but used to be really common uh, in, the, in the middle of the 20th century where people could just drive up, put the little radio thing in their dash and, and watch the movie from their car. Um, motels. Uh, usually a lot of times if you saw hotels back in the day, they were usually like in cities or and occasionally you'd find them, you know, on uh, some of the highways that went across the country. But um, as interstates became more and more common throughout the 50s and 60s, more motels popped up, Holiday Inn being a prime example uh, of that. And the idea of driving to a place far away on vacation becomes um, something that sort of enters pop culture. You know, Disneyland opened in California in 1955. And so um, people began driving across the country to go to California or they drive to the national parks and that kind of stuff. So um, cars really opened things up for, for a lot of people 
teenagers and, and families um, overall. And of course, again, made it easier to live in the suburbs and commute to your job. You didn't have to drive, didn't have to ride the train if you didn't want to or whatever. But it's worth also pointing out finally that maybe not everything was as conformist as you would think if you just watched 1950s TV shows. Um, you begin to have a teenage culture for the first time. The, the word teenager didn't really enter the lexicon in America until the 1950s. And it was worth pointing out that you know not all teenagers were like uh, the, the perfect kids in shows like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver and, and all of that. Um, you know, there were plenty of teenagers who um, went out and and got into trouble or or had sex uh, with with girlfriends or boyfriends, what I, you know, whatever. Um, and those things weren't talked about, but there were movies that kind of there was a whole subgenre of like juvenile delinquency films in the 1950s. Um, most prevalently, probably Rebel Without a Cause, which was James Dean and Natalie Wood. Um, good movie, holds up worth watching. Um, and the bit about not having sex outside of marriage also applies to adults, by the way. There were some studies that were rather explosive that were done in the 50s that showed that, uh, you know, the, the rate of, of people who were having sex before marriage uh, was, you know, at least 50%, maybe as high as 80 to 90%. But if you watch TV or, or you know, uh, read some things that were put out in the 50s, you would think that, that was zero, uh, which was far, far, far from uh, from the case. Um, some other signs of uh, this teenage rebellion we mentioned, uh, rock and roll music um, starts in the early 1950s, becomes really common. Uh, black and white artists, you know, uh, uh, some notable African-American uh uh, rock and roll stars early on, Fats Domino, Lloyd Price, uh, Little Richard, right? Um, but uh, the, the first big rock superstar was Elvis Presley, who hit it big about 1956, uh, appeared on the Elvis Sullivan Show, you know, just becomes a, a pop culture, um, you know, icon all to himself. Um, you begin to see rock and roll show up on television, uh, like the TV show American Bandstand, which was literally just teenagers dancing to rock and roll music. And they showed it on TV for half an hour virtually every day. And it was a, one of the biggest shows on television. Um, you know, plenty of adults thought it was going to ruin their kids and turn them into, you know, James Dean and without a cause. But most people did not end up turning into criminals. Um, there was also a literary movement that uh, criticized all its conformity in the 50s. Um, this was kind of your hipsters or your or of the time, I guess. The beat movement, uh, which uh, was a lot of poetry and, and literature that criticized all this consumerism and materialism and conformity that was going on, saying it was leading to, you know, empty, um, unfulfilling lives, right? Um, and some uh, notable authors there, Jack Kerouac, who writes a book called On the Road. Uh, Allen Ginsberg had a notable poem called Howl about the dissatisfaction that his generation was feeling with all of this. And um, people who were kind of adherents to the beat movement were typically called beatniks. Um, a picture down there at the bottom is from a TV show called The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis uh, from the 50s. Um, and this guy, Bob Denver's character there uh, on the left with the bongos was uh, seen as an example of a, of a hippie, um, whereas the other guy was your you know, stereotypical clean teen, basic buddy comedy stuff. But um, this this resistance to conformity and kind of this low, you know, low level rebellion that was going on throughout the 1950s among young people uh, would be uh, one of the biggest catalysts that led to you know, some, some significant social movements throughout the later part of the 20th century, the civil rights movement where African-Americans obviously were, you know, mad that they weren't being uh, beneficiaries of all this prosperity, uh, women being dissatisfied with not being able to get high level jobs and go to college and stuff like that leads to the women's liberation movement. Um, and then more, you know, kids going to college and kind of getting these ideas um, about social justice also leads to like the environmental movement and stuff as well. So, um, you know, this, this uh, resistance to just having this cookie cutter life, uh, again, does lead to quite a bit of activism and uh, all of that uh, in the years that follow. That'll be it for today. Feel free to post some comments in the uh, uh, um, section below this video if you uh, have any questions. But otherwise, uh, thanks for listening and cheers.